Hello and welcome to this blender cookie tutorial. My name is Kent Trammell and today I want to walk you through the process of creating this jellyfish scene from start to finish. Uh, so why jellyfish? Uh, well they're just so weird, so alien, kind of creepy and scary, yet beautiful at the same time. It's also an opportunity to explore some very strange material types, stuff most people don't see every day. And uh, well I thought it would be a fun image for you to recreate yourself. So from beginning to end we will cover modeling using a lot of cloth simulation, materials and lighting with cycles, and adding final touches with the compositor. Now let's take a look at some reference. Here I have four different images and I'm not sure if all of these are the exact same species but they're similar enough to inform the final result that I'm going for and since it's not a piece for National Geographic I'm not too concerned if the anatomy matches a particular species exactly, but it will help to break down the anatomy a little bit just to guide me in the modeling process. So I'm going to unhide a uh, grease pencil layer, and um, I guess I didn't realize that the scale of the grease pencil does not match or isn't locked to the scale of the image, so let me try and resize this. There we go. Um, so up here, the mushroom top is called the bell, and these long uh, frilly type tentacles are called the oral arms. And finally, we have these very thin, long, strand-like tentacles, which uh, I believe are called tentacles uh, or lappets. And uh, each of these we will concentrate on uh, one at a time, first being these frilly arms. In this fresh scene, let's uh, add a mesh plane and uh, rotate this in edit mode in the x-axis 90 degrees and also move it up with G, Z and 1, move it up one grid unit to make it flush with the grid floor. Now let's uh, move up these top two vertices to elongate the plane substantially, about like that. And now I want to cut three edge loops vertically with control R and roll up on my mouse wheel to give me three edges. There we go. Now hit enter twice to complete the cut. And then horizontally again with control R, I want to uh, scroll up on the mouse wheel, basically trying to get an even square grid over the entire plane. So that looks good. Enter twice. And what we want to do with this plane is simulate it with cloth so that we get those frilly edges that we saw in the reference. So what we need to create now is a vertex group for pinning certain vertices. So let's go over to our object data. I'm going to add a new vertex group. And I'm going to call it pin. And uh, this middle vertical edge loop, I want to assign it to that vertex group uh, at a weight of one. So let's click assign and then the edge loops on each side we want to add that also to the pin vertex group, but at a weight of 0.5. And now when we simulate our cloth, uh, the vertex here in the middle will completely ignore the simulation, while the edge loops on either side uh, only participate in half of the cloth calculation. And what this allows us to do is create a shape key uh, where we can animate these vertices. So uh, we have to add a shape key in object mode. So we'll click once to get the basis, click again to get our actual uh, first shape key. I'll change the value all the way uh, to one. Tab back into edit mode, and I'm going to scale all three of these edge loops vertically, but uh, I want to use the median pivot point. So let's scale it down to about there. And in my shape keys, uh, we have a button right here that will toggle the shape keys visibility in edit mode. So we'll turn that on. And this allows us to interactively slide between the shape key at zero and the shape key at one. So it's another way of animating our mesh. And now before we actually simulate this, let's split my window vertically and make this bottom narrow window the timeline where on frame one, Let's change our shape key value to zero, hover over the number, hit I on our keyboard to insert a keyframe there, and then jump all the way to frame 60 in our timeline and change the value of our shape key to one and insert another keyframe. Let's go back to frame one in our timeline and uh, we're ready to actually set this object up 
for cloth simulation. We can do that over here in the physics tab, then click cloth, and this becomes a cloth object. Uh, so if I hit Alt A in the viewport, um, we don't get what we want, we just see the object fall down. This does mean it's being simulated, but we haven't told the settings to respect those pinned verts. So over here in this first cloth drop down uh, settings panel, uh, we have a pinning toggle. Let's turn that on and then select the vertex group that we want. And now in the viewport, if I hit Alt A, we get simulation and um, there we go. We get some very even frills that don't look particularly nice. But um, what you'll notice is at the beginning of the cloth simulation, we have the verts pulling down on one another, but they all stay in a perfectly straight line until a certain point, until just before that second keyframe. And uh, once it settles, it's just a little bit too even. So let's go ahead and smooth the shading on this mesh and also add a subdivision surface modifier so we can see the smoothed result that this geometry would give us. And while we do have some frills, they're just way too even and I would prefer a more random chaotic look. So we can change a few things. Let's see here. For one, I think that I can change the second keyframe. Let's see here. Yeah, the second keyframe on our shape key. Instead of one, let's take it down to about 0.7 instead. Not all the way. Hit I over that number again to uh, reinsert that keyframe. And also, I don't think there's quite enough geometry to get the frequency of frilling that I'm looking for. So in my modifier stack, let's uh, take the subsurface modifier that I added and push it above the cloth modifier. Jump back to frame one and let's try simulating that now. There we go. It's a lot more uh, detailed in the frills. If I add another subsurface on top, we can see what that looks like smooth. So we get more frilling, but it's still quite even. So to break that up, I'm going to go back to frame one and add, let's see, a force field turbulence effector. And in the physics panel for the effector, I'll change the strength up to, let's say, 100 to start off with and the size up to one. And also the noise, let's make that, well, let's make it 10. And try simulating that again. There we go. And uh, right away from the beginning, you can see that the effector introduces a lot of noise and randomness to the cloth sim. But then once it settles, it kind of turns even again. So let's see, how about I uh, undo what I did earlier and go back to frame 60 and change the um, shape key value to one again. Insert the keyframe. And for the effector, instead of a strength of 100, let's make it 500, make it a lot stronger. Simulate that now. Yeah, that's much more random, much more what I'm looking for. And by changing the um, uh, second keyframe back to a value of one for the shape key, this now gives me um, some room to play with the simulation so I can scroll back and choose a keyframe that I, I think is a little bit better. Let's see here. I think that one looks pretty good. I'll settle on this one. Oh wait, actually, there's one more thing I want to do. Let's go back to frame one and in our cloth settings for our uh, mesh plane here, let's see under cloth collision, let's enable self collision. By default, that's off and the mesh can intersect with itself. By turning that on, it also gives us a slightly different result uh, in the simulation. So now let's hit Alt A and see what that gives us. Yeah, it's not drastically different, but uh, I can tell a difference. So let's scroll back through the timeline, see if there's a better frame that we like. Yeah, I think frame 40 looks pretty good. All right, so uh, now we're done with the cloth simulation and we're ready to apply this mesh modification to our geometry. So 
In our modifier stack, I want to get rid of our subsurface, uh, the highest level subsurface. And uh, instead of applying each of these modifiers one by one, I'll simply hit Alt C in the viewport and convert to mesh. That will clear out all my modifiers and apply them. That way we have a base mesh with no uh, modifiers on it. And let's see here. Um, if I want to increase the frills that we see, I can select all of my mesh components with A and let's scale in the Y direction. There we go. Now my frills are a little bit more intense. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Now this uh, is clearly not long enough to represent the tentacle arm that we saw in our reference. So uh, that's okay. I've basically created a section that I can now duplicate uh, with the array modifier. So first in edit mode, I'll select everything and I want to bring it down to be flat with the grid floor again. Let's see. Let's hover it a little bit above, about like that. And uh, let's go ahead and add the array modifier, which by default starts duplicating it in the X direction. So let's see, over here in the relative offset side of the modifier settings, this first value is X, second value Y, and the third value is Z. So let's uh, change the X value to zero and the third value or the Z value to one. And by relative offset, it dynamically calculates the dimensions of our mesh that we can see here, which are the dimensions of the object data, not the object. See the scale up here is the size of the object itself, but the object data can be bigger than that. So if I take this uh, top edge loop and move it up, this increases the Z dimensions, but not the Z scale. And you can see that the uh, array modifier takes this into account when we're using relative offset instead of constant offset. But uh, the way we have it now is the top and bottom edges are rounded and they're not flat. So we want this array modifier to look like one unified tentacle arm. And the way we can do that, let's move this back down, is to flatten off the top and bottom edge loop. So let's see, I will turn on proportional editing connected mode and let's scale down, modify the uh, fall off with my mouse wheel and let's scale it to zero. There we go. Maybe move it up slightly with proportional editing turned off. About like that. Yeah, that looks good. And then on the bottom, Let's see, since the array modifier is duplicating and I uh, have options over here to merge, I want the top edge loop to match exactly the bottom edge loop. So let's duplicate that with Shift D. And then over here in the transform, let's change the Z value to zero and that should set it flat to the floor, which it does. Now let's uh, get rid of the old bottom edge loop, just like that. Select the edge loop and this new edge loop, control E and uh, let's see, bridge two edge loops, just like that. Select this edge loop in the middle and let's uh, smooth the transition in between the two over here with smooth vertex. There we go. Now they should match up uh, perfectly at the top and bottom of each uh, segment in the array. So we can turn up the count as high as we want and they will always uh, be touching and lining up. Uh, now that they do line up, we can turn on merge. And since the verts match up exactly the same, we shouldn't have to change the distance. We can test this by simply adding a, a subdivision surface modifier and we shouldn't be able to see the connection, which we don't. So that is good. Now we can make our tentacle arm as uh, long as we like. I think that a count of five, yeah, I think that'll be long enough. I will go ahead and minimize that modifier. And uh, let's see, I want to now modify this entire tentacle as a whole in two ways. Uh, first, let's do it with a lattice. So shift A, uh, let's see, lattice. There we go. Uh, now in object mode, I want to um, transform and scale this lattice 
to basically encase my tentacle arm. So let's scale it up. It's important to do this in object mode. And then let's go into a side orthographic view. I think that looks good. Front view, I think that looks good as well. Cool. Um, in the lattice uh, object data panel, let's tweak our UVW values. Um, let's see. Okay, we'll add one in the U, one in the V, and then let's see, let's go 24 in the W. This way we have enough resolution in our lattice to appropriately um, affect the mesh underneath. And now we can hook that up to our tentacle. Let's see, with another modifier, and it is the lattice modifier. We will put that in between the array and subsurface mods. And then we'll pick our lattice object, which is just called lattice. And now when we tab into edit mode on the lattice and change our verts here, we can see that it modifies the mesh underneath. And what this will allow me to do if I turn on, let's see, proportional editing, which apparently Alt-O is not the right hotkey when dealing with a lattice. So I'll just turn that on manually. We can use just the uh, regular enabled mode. And uh, well, before I make any changes, I want to get in the habit of only making changes uh, with a shape key. So uh, before I change anything, let's add a shape key on the lattice and now go back to edit mode uh, with the value at one on my shape key. What I wanna do is make the top of our tentacle a little bit thicker and uh, have it taper towards the bottom. So let's hit S to scale it up. And with my mouse wheel, I will increase the fall off. There we go, I think that looks good. And then at the bottom, let's see, I will choose this point in the middle and let's move it down to uh, make it come to a point. Let's decrease the fall off of proportional editing. There we go. Then scale this down with the sharp fall off preset. There we go. Uh, let's see, in my display settings for the viewport, I'll turn on only render just to get a quick look at that without the um, lattice around it, very cool. Turn that back off, and only one more change do I wanna make with this lattice. Again, with proportional editing on, let's change the falloff type to linear, then hit G, and let's see, scroll up on my mouse wheel, or down actually on my mouse wheel, till the falloff affects the entire lattice uh, in a linear fashion. So you can see it all follows very linearly as opposed to this where you know it only uh, follows halfway. So that fall off looks good. Now um, hit RZ to rotate in the Z direction. And I'm just going to rotate it around until it basically spins the entire tentacle. Turn on only render so we can see what that did. If we look at it now, we can see that it's all twisted like a corkscrew. So this just helps to randomize the tentacle as a whole. And yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with that. I'll go back to the modifier stack on our mesh. Let's see, turn off only render and uh, minimize that lattice modifier. And now the second way I want to tweak the entire tentacle arm after the array modifier is with a Bezier curve. This will allow us to essentially pose the tentacle arm into any smooth flowing curve position that we want. So uh, in the uh, 3D viewport, let's click Shift A to add a curve, Bezier curve, that will be put here down at the origin or rather wherever the cursor is, which is at the origin by default. I will tab into edit mode to reorient this Bezier curve. Now we can see that the arrows are pointing in the flow direction of this curve. So I want those arrows to point up from bottom to top. So I'll select all of my uh, curve points, hit R, Y, and rotate negative 90 degrees. Arrows are still pointing up. On this bottom point, which by default is rotated at 45 degrees, so I'll hit R, X, to rotate it 45, to, oh wait a minute, I have proportional editing turned on, let's turn that off and try RX 45, there we go, now it's straight up and down. 
and I want to place these curved points as close to the bottom tip and top tip of the tentacle arm. There we go. Now it's important that you notice that I'm making these modifications in edit mode because in object mode we can see that the origin of my Bezier curve is here at the origin of the world, the same as my mesh here. The origins in object mode need to match up. So instead of scaling my object um, in edit mode, I prefer to move the points. It's just a little bit cleaner. So uh, with both of them selected now, in my curve tools, let's look for right here, subdivide. Let's subdivide it. Yeah, I think that'll be good. It gives me five total points. Now uh, back in object mode, I will select the tentacle mesh, add another modifier, curve modifier, and let's throw this below the subsurface and above the lattice modifier. Now I know I'm saying below, but visually I'm actually putting the modifier above. So the way to think of this modifier stack is the way that you would write out a list on a, a piece of notebook paper. So number one goes up top, number two below it, three, four, five, and six. And that's the same way. Array modifiers number one, lattice number two, three, and four. It's the opposite of how it looks visually because the subsurface modifier is technically the top of the stack, whereas this array modifier is the bottom, the foundation of the modifier stack. So I know it's visually confusing when I say place the curve modifier below subsurface when visually it's above. But anyway, um, now that we have that modifier um, assigned, let's choose the object, the curve object that it's to follow. Uh, Bezier curve is the only one in the scene, but we'll notice that it offsets immediately. And that's because the deformation axis is along the X. We want it to be uh, in the Z axis. And uh, I'll go ahead and hide this lattice because it's visually confusing. Now, if we select the curve and move our points around, we can see that our mesh follows the curve, which is pretty awesome. This will uh, make it very easy to artistically position um, our tentacle arms. And uh, let's undo those changes. And I want you to notice that as I move this point here, the mesh maintains its overall length rather than matching the length of our curve. Uh, and in this situation, I actually want the mesh to match the length of the curve, not maintain its own inherent length. So on, uh, let's see, the curve object, let's go to the object data for that. And in the shape uh, drop down panel, which should be at the top, in the bottom right corner, we have path slash curve deform settings. So let's turn on stretch and bounds clamp. Now in edit mode, as I move the end point of the curve, you'll notice that the tentacle mesh stretches to match it. And that's what I'm looking for. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much set up and uh, ready to be posed, except for one more thing that I wanna add before I start duplicating this uh, tentacle arm around. And that's to add a little bit of thickness to the tentacle mesh. Right now it's just paper thin and nothing in reality is actually paper thin, not even paper. So we can easily do this with the uh, solidify modifier. And hopefully what you notice with the modifier stack here is by maintaining the stack itself, I've saved a lot of manual work with traditional uh, modeling. Because if I tab into edit mode, this tiny section of the tentacle is the only piece of geometry I have to worry about. Yet um, through the modifier stack, I'm getting this elongated tentacle arm that I can customize on multiple different levels, first with the lattice, then with the curve, and now with the solidify. So I guess I want you to notice how powerful the modifier stack can be and how it can make your life much easier. But um, anyway, back to the solidify modifier. Let's see, I can crank up my thickness a little bit there we go, about like that, which by default, it sort of extrudes new geometry in a certain direction, but um, that's because the offset is set to negative one. So let's change that to zero. And uh, here is what I'm looking for with the thickness modifier. In the middle of the tentacle, I want there to be a thickness of about 0.4. 
but on the edges of the tentacle with all these frills, I want it to be much skinnier, like maybe 0.1. And we can control this with another vertex group. So let's change the thickness to 0.4. Um, to be the thickness, the maximum thickness that I'm looking for, which is the middle of the tentacle. Actually, how about 0.6? Let's make it a little thicker. And now jump over to the object data panel, click the plus button to add a new vertex group. I'm going to call this thickness. Tab into edit mode and zoom in on this little piece of geometry we have editing access to. And I will select these three edge loops in the middle assign it with a weight of one to our thickness group and now back in object mode go back to the modifier stack and uh, below clamp we have a little vertex group icon and let's choose thickness and there we go we can see now that in the middle we have a thickness of 0.6 but on the outside uh, it's actually a thickness of zero because the weight is zero and we don't want it to be paper thin because that actually gives us errors where the mesh is intersecting itself. Um, so let's jump into weight paint mode with control tab. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna go down here to the bottom. I guess it really doesn't matter where I paint, but I basically want to smooth out the vertex group weights, trying to keep that middle strip uh, as close to red as I can. So let's choose the blur brush and start painting. Let's see, for this I will turn off the array modifier. Actually, all of my modifiers, except for solidify. Yeah, there we go. And just concentrate on the original uh, geometry section. And let's smooth out these mesh weights. There we go. If I look at the profile of the geometry, um, the middle strip is no longer red, so it's no longer a thickness value of 0.6. So to try and regain that uh, red strip, meaning a value of 1, down the middle, I can use some, uh, some of my weight tools over here, particularly the uh, levels. So let's click that and we have some options to adjust the gain, which you can see that it intensifies the weights that are already there. So we're starting to get that uh, red value of one in the middle, but also on the edges, the value is increasing as well, making it a little too thick. So let's see if we can play with the offset. Yeah, um, taking the offset down makes the edges thinner than the middle section. Okay, let's see what that looks like with um, the rest of our modifiers turned back on. Yeah, I think that'll work out nicely. Maybe increase the thickness just a bit. There we go. You can see now how in the middle the thickness is more heavily influenced than on the edges. So yeah, how about a value of 1 for the thickness? There we go. Now the tentacle is finished and ready to be posed. But before I duplicate, let's make sure that um, all of these objects that are assisting with my modifiers are named appropriately. Uh, so that includes this lattice, and let's call it arm underscore lat dot zero zero zero. And then for the plane, that just needs to be called arm dot zero zero zero. The Bezier curve, arm curve dot zero zero zero. We can get rid of this field. And now I will add, let's see here, an empty, let's use a cube shaped empty. I'll move it up to the top of the tentacle. And uh, we'll name this arm group dot zero zero zero. Now uh, select arm curve, the arm geometry, arm lattice, and finally the arm group and control P parent it uh, to the object. Oh, except the lattice did not get parented because it was hidden. Let's undo that parenting. Um, unhide the lattice. Now hit control P. Now I can control the entire arm um, with one object while maintaining the connection of the lattice and the curve. So I can go in and uh, pose the tentacle arm as well as change the shape of the lattice. 
which you can see doesn't quite match because of the local transforms and the um, order of the stack. But um, yeah, this is exactly how I want it to work. So uh, let's undo those changes that I made. And uh, what this hierarchy now allows us to do is I can hit Shift G to select all of the children, then uh, reselect the group to make it the active object, and I can hit Shift D to duplicate another arm, as many as I want, while still maintaining uh, the hierarchy uh, in the modifiers for each object. So this lattice affects the correct arm, and this curve also affects the correct arm as well. And yeah, that's going to be it for the tentacle arm. I'll undo those duplications. And uh, now I'll move on to the bell portion of our jellyfish.